Hello, everyone. Welcome to Virology Live. This is session number 19. Today, we're going to talk about vaccines, a lecture that is always relevant and important, but perhaps now uh, even more so. Welcome, everyone. Vaccines are our proven best defense against viruses. They mobilize our immune systems to prevent virus disease. And they also immobilize immune memory. So you don't need to be immunized over and over, except in certain situations, as you'll see today. Vaccination breaks the chain of transmission of viruses, or that, that's the idea anyway, or at least reduces it. Nothing eliminates anything entirely, as you know. And so between the two, uh, vaccines have a major effect on viral infections, at least for those for which they're developed, of course. Now, on the right here is a <clears throat> graph that I have been showing uh, since I began teaching this course way in the beginning, 12 years ago or so. It shows life expectancy for men and women from 1900 through about uh, 2010, I, I think, here on this graph. Uh, and you can see that our life expectancy has steadily increased uh, over time. Looks like we're probably reaching a plateau of 75 or so for men, 80 years or so for women. But much of this increase in longevity is due to public health measures, medicines of various sorts, uh, and vaccines, no doubt. Big, big dip here in 1918, of course, the 1918 influenza pandemic. And I'm, I'm assuming that when we move beyond 2021 on this graph, uh, we will see a similar dip uh, in those years because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And already in 2020, U.S. life expectancy has dropped about 1.5 years. So vaccines have a terrific effect on our longevity. They work by stimulating a protective immune response without the pathogenic consequences of a virus infection, of course. <clears throat> Here's a diagram of the immune response, the adaptive immune response, which we've seen before. And let's go over it again because it's important. Here we have on the y-axis either antibodies or T-cells, antibody levels, T-cell numbers, adaptive immune response, and then uh, time on the y-axis. And here is our first infection with, a, with our virus, and within... A certain number of days, and this is always a, an average, and it can vary according to the person, according to the virus. The immune response uh, kicks in. You have antibodies and T cells made, but of course, it doesn't happen immediately. Those those processes of making antibodies, of making T cells, take time, and so we have a delay. But eventually, antibody and T cell levels rise. And as you have seen, when we talk about acute infections, they often rise as the acute infection is declining. So this is a late event. But with time, antibodies and T cell levels will contract. I'm not going to use the word that everyone else seems to be using, the W word. Uh, but contract is the correct immunological term because it is what happens after every infection, after every vaccination, Antibodies and T cells contract to some low but not zero level. And the fact that there is a low level means that there are memory cells, both B memory and T memory cells present that are continually giving rise to low levels of antibodies and low numbers of T cells. But they're there to protect you. You don't need to maintain high levels of antibodies and T cells. This seems to be a... Um, misunderstanding of how immunology works that has been exemplified or I should say amplified in the current pandemic. Now, let's say you encounter the pathogen again. You encounter the virus perhaps years later. 
you will have a far more rapid response in the production of antibodies and T cells, as you can see here by the sharp nature uh, of this line. And as a consequence, you will have either a mild or an inapparent infection. The, that's the key here. And this, this figure has been in our textbook since the, the first edition many years ago, 20 years ago. Mild or inapparent infection on, on memory response. Why is that? Well, the memory response isn't immediate. It takes a few days for the B cells to become activated, for the T cells to become activated, for antibodies to be made. And so you will become infected. The virus will reproduce in you wherever it may be, the respiratory tract, the GI tract, whatever the virus is, and you may shed a little bit of virus, probably not enough to transmit on the whole. Uh, but if you any, develop any symptoms, they will be mild or inapparent. That's what vaccines do. They prevent disease. We test them to prevent disease. We tested the polio vaccines to prevent paralysis. We did not test to prevent infection. We tested the COVID vaccines to prevent COVID, not infection. So to change the bar during the pandemic to say, now we need to prevent infection seems uh, inconsistent with what we try to do. Anyway, this is how vaccines work. There is always a delay in the memory recall. Consequently, infection is typically not prevented but disease is prevented. This is what we have known about vaccines for ages. The first vaccine uh, in, is attributed to Jenner, although there is some um, argument about this in, in the history books, as always. But in 1796, of course, Jenner observed uh, that um, milkmaids never got smallpox, which at the time was a rampant disease, uh, and he, they did get some other kind of rash disease called cowpox from cows or horses, where, wherever that, that virus came from. And so he thought that uh, perhaps if he inoculated people with uh, material from lesions of cowpox, they could be resistant. Now, he knew nothing of infectious diseases. He knew nothing of viruses or bacteria. He just knew that people who survived smallpox didn't get it again. And he knew that milkmaids rarely got smallpox. And so he inoculated a young boy with uh, material from cowpox pustules from a milkmaid and then challenged him two weeks later with material from a smallpox pustule, assuming that whatever was infecting people or afflicting people, I should say, was in the pustules. And the boy was protected. Good thing uh, Jenner waited two weeks, I suppose. And so the vaccine that uh, Jenner developed uh, ha was then used throughout the years, and its use spread to many different countries. Uh, and uh, in, in modern times, it's delivered uh, by uh, scarification of the skin using this bifurcated needle that's carrying a drop of the, the vaccine. The vaccine, of course, uh, is not smallpox virus, but rather something related to uh, cowpox virus or horse horsepox virus or vaccinia. Complicated story there. Of course, this led to the, the use of this vaccine led to the eradication of smallpox in 1979. And only certain people to this day, the military, et cetera, get vaccinated against smallpox. Uh, in 1885, Pasteur developed the next vaccine, a rabies virus vaccine, and he introduced the term vaccination in honor of Jenner because vaca stands for cow in Latin. And then the next vaccines came in the 1930s against yellow fever. Uh, and influenza virus. Of course, as soon as the first uh, inoculations were done by Jenner, the anti-vaccine people came to the forefront. Here is a print from Jenner's era showing the cowpox or the wonderful effects of the new inoculation. The idea being, if you got Jenner's inoculation, you would grow cow parts from the places where you were inoculated. And of course, these anti-vaccine sentiments persist to this day. Nevertheless, many vaccines have been developed and we have found that large-scale vaccination campaigns can be very successful over the years. We have done large-scale vaccinations for 
of example, against polio. Polio reaching its peak numbers of cases in the U.S. and globally uh, in the 50s, the inactivated vaccine licensed in 55, the uh, attenuated vaccine licensed in 1962. Its use has eliminated polio from the U.S. and many other countries, and as we'll see, it's, it's on the brink of being eradicated globally. Measles vaccination has also been a successful campaign, introduced uh, the vaccine in the 60s, uh, has essentially eliminated uh, measles from the U.S. and other countries except that because of anti-vaccine sentiment, there are outbreaks globally that seed virus into the U.S. and there are always pockets of susceptible people. Now, protection by vaccines, as we'll see in a bit, uh, doesn't work if there are pockets of people who are not immunized. On the right is a nice graph showing the lives saved by measles vaccination over the years uh, from 2000 to 2016, uh, the estimated number of measles deaths without vaccination and the actual deaths with vaccination. The, the area in between those two is the number of lives saved. So vaccination always saves lives. And vaccines are a part of our existence now. As you have seen the narrative in the last couple of years, uh, that was the first thing that we decided to do was make vaccines against this new coronavirus. We, we immunize children. We always have immunized children. Uh, we immunized adults of all ages. We immunize our domesticated animals, not only farm animals, but pets. We even immunize wild animals. We drop rabies vaccine-laced bait into forests from helicopters, and that reduces the viral loads of rabies in wild animal populations. The animals eat the bait, and they become immunized. As a consequence of immunization, many childhood diseases are rare, uh, and their vaccines are a major part of our public health measures in the West, but not in developing nations still. And we've talked about how measles vaccination is insufficient globally. Rubella is also. And as you can see, the disparity today in COVID vaccinations extends uh, throughout the world. And that's an unfortunate aspect of the vaccines because they can work, but not if you don't give them to people. A key concept about how vaccines work is herd immunity. I have been teaching herd immunity for 12 years now in this course and even longer. And of course, now we have many experts on herd immunity who never mentioned the word before, but so be it. Herd immunity is maintenance of a critical level of immunity in the population. Population scale immunity. That's what we're talking about. You have to buy in to the fact that you're going to protect other people if you get vaccinated. I have no problem buying into that, and many other people don't. But there's some people who do not have the altruistic gene, unfortunately. So uh, herd immunity means that if enough people are immunized, then others who are not immunized will be protected. Here's a diagram of that. We have an infected individual in red, and uh, unvaccinated, uninfected individuals uh, in black there. And they're all able to be infected because they're not vaccinated. But uh, when the people are then vaccinated, then they become green here in this uh, diagram. The, the infected person can no longer transmit to those individuals. And so the likelihood that the unimmunized individuals can receive the infection is decreased it's never eliminated. It's decreased uh, because there are always pockets of unimmunized people. For example, before we could immunize children, there would be classrooms full of unimmunized children. So there's not going to be any herd immunity in that situation. There are probably towns where nobody wants to be vaccinated or very few people. So herd immunity, the idea is at the population level, but there are always pockets that make it not work. So herd virus spread drops when the probability of infection falls below a critical threshold. And we are not yet there, obviously, with COVID, although we have uh, peaks and valleys in our infection. And this threshold is virus and population specific. For ex example, the R0, uh, the reproductive index, 
attempts to capture some of the variables that uh, control or represent whether how well a virus uh, spreads in a population. Uh, so, for example, uh, for smallpox, we need 80 to 85 percent of a population immune to reduce transmission and therefore disease. For measles, it's even higher. 93 to 95 percent of the population needs to be immune in order to reduce transmission. And the problem here, of course, is that no virus is 100 percent effective at reducing uh, excuse, excuse me, no vaccine is 100% effective at uh, inducing immunity. If you give it to 100 people, you're never going to have 100 people respond in the same way. And so that further complicates achieving this. Now, an example is with measles. When 80% of the population uh, is given measles vaccine, only 76% ends up being immune, as measured by, say, antibody levels. So you're always going to have a fraction of people that don't respond. And please keep that in mind when you hear about infections in vaccinated people. There may be an issue in those people that we don't know about. So for SARS-CoV-2, one of the ways you can calculate the amount of herd immunity you need to impede transmission is from the r naught, the reproductive index. This is uh, not a precise science, I would say, because the reproductive index is a an attempt to capture three different variables that contribute to the ability of a virus to move through a population. That's why it's called reproductive index. And that's uh, the probability of infection given contact, the average duration of contact between uh, the infected and uninfected host, and the duration of infectivity. Obviously, C is a host-specific property. It depends on how long people are together. And some of these, uh, for example, D, depends on the virus. So it's really a mixture of the two. Now, the R0 is calculated early in an outbreak, before population immunity rises, before interventions are introduced. So it's thought to be the raw R0, but it never really is because one population is different from, from other populations. Nevertheless, it's an estimate. It's more of a guideline, I would say. It's not a rule. And so the number of people who must be vaccinated to impede spread is 1 minus 1 over the over R0. So uh, originally, the R0 for SARS-CoV-2 was calculated to be 2 to 3. And if you use that, you get 50 to 70 percent. Uh, I... You cannot calculate the R0 today. You have to do other estimations of RE or RT, and most of those are, are quite flawed. So it's just not clear how we uh, interpret that in terms of herd immunity because obviously many populations are, have a lot of immunity and they, there can still be outbreaks, mostly in the unvaccinated, at least of severe disease. Anyway, that's how you deal with the um, calculation. Now, fortunately, despite having so many good vaccines, as you'll see today, hesitancy is, is, is a problem. As they say here, it's dangerous to any vaccine program. And the ability to immunize the population and prevent disease depends on the intersection of these three variables, the confidence in the vaccine. As you saw, some people felt that the mRNA vaccines, for example, were new and therefore shouldn't be, be trusted. Complacency. Some people think COVID is not a big deal, which, of course, is wrong. But if, if you're dying, it is a big deal. And, of course, convenience, the extent to which you can get a vaccine. And it's been made easier because of the pandemic. But before that, it's not often easy for parents to get their children vaccinated, for example, especially to go back for multiple doses. And so all of these things uh, together work to either help or not get people vaccinated. And all these things that people say have been said for years. You certainly recognize some of them. Excuses why people don't want to be vaccinated. I don't have time. I'm not injecting anything into my body. These are excuses. They have no basis except to put up a reason why you're not doing what really is the best thing to do. Uh, and when these kinds of attitudes prevail, we have issues with large-scale programs, as we do with the COVID vaccine program in the U.S. Uh, 
globally, of course, there are other reasons why we can't immunize everyone. But here in the U.S., there's no reason why everyone can't be immunized. And if we were, the variants would not be scaring people as they are now. It would be not an issue any longer. Now, as you know, in, in many states in the U.S., there are uh, both religious and medical exempt exemptions. Many states are, are uh, getting rid of the religious exemptions, but medical exemptions are indicated in about 1% of the population. However, we often exceed that number in certain parts of the, of the U.S. For example, in certain counties in Texas, the number of medical exemptions exceeds 50%. And this is medically impossible. This is because doctors simply sign off on the request for a medical exemption, and they're inappropriately given. We had a nice discussion about this on TWIV 496. We had a couple of physicians on to talk about that, and they're the source of that information. 1% should be the maximum medical exemptions based on medical conditions that preclude vaccination. Now, of course, uh, vaccination programs depend on public acceptance and because there has been um, a reluctance in certain groups to vaccinate against measles, we have outbreaks. And here are uh, cases of measles in the U.S. from 2010 to 2020. And you can see some years, over 1,000 cases, mainly in communities that together decide not to vaccinate their kids. Uh, fortunately, in 2020, it went way down because of the, uh, uh, the, the things we did to prevent transmission of, of covid 19 virus. Now, on the right is a, a map of the U.S. where it is marked we have cases of measles um, that were not tied to religious communities uh, or were tied to unvaccinated members of religious communities. Just to, just to uh, point out one group of individuals, by no means not the only one, but uh, often religious leaders will tell their congregations, don't take this vaccine, and then they all listen and there are outbreaks. So here in yellow are the states with confirmed measles cases, and then here this uh, outbreak of 58 measles in a unvaccinated members of an Orthodox Jewish community in Brooklyn, and this has also happened more recently in upstate New York. The rabbi says, don't take this vaccine uh, in here we have a Hare Krishna community where there was an outbreak of measles. Here we have a uh, church in Texas where the pastor had been critical of vaccination. So uh, these communities listen to their leaders, but the leaders don't know anything about vaccines. So they, they, someone tells them or they hear somewhere that the, the vaccine isn't good and they pass it on, but they're really uninformed, unfortunately. If you want to learn about vaccines, you, know, you should speak to a doctor or uh, a virologist, I would think. Uh, time for our first question, and that, that is running already. So uh, herd immunity, A, demonstrates the importance of immunizing livestock. B, emphasizes that not everyone must be immune to protect the population. C, emphasizes that everyone must be immune to protect the population. D, describes how groupthink can dominate anti-vaccine choices or all of the above. And let us take some questions here. Good, good mix of people here this morning. Good to see everyone this morning, this evening, tomorrow. <laughs> what a mix. Do the T-cells from vaccines work against Delta? Uh, yes, they do. They do work against Delta-infected cells because the T-cell epitopes are largely unchanged in Delta and, by the way, also in Omicron. So T-cells pr protect you against severe disease, hospitalization, and death, uh, and they will do so against all the variants. Would measuring the memory response be doable? Uh, it's hard to do. The easiest thing to do is to take serum and measure neutralizing antibodies, right? So memory cells is a harder thing, and then you're only going to be able to, member, to measure memory cells in the blood, which may not give you a complete picture because, remember, many of the memory cells are in bone marrow or lymphoid organs. So I don't think that's, at the, with current technology, that that's really useful. 
but the CDC changed the definition. Well, I'm, the CDC is not virology, okay? They're a public health agency trying to control something. I don't think they're right. The vaccines provide immunity against disease. And I, I don't care. I write the book along with my colleagues, and we decide <laughs> what the definition is. Wasn't there a polio scare around 78? There was an outbreak of polio in a Amish community in Pennsylvania, and of course they do not immunize. So it wasn't a scare. It was just the consequence of not being vaccinated. Would be interesting to know the numbers of mild and measles. And, yes, it would be, but we don't because prior to this outbreak, we barely tested anyone for polio vaccine trials, we looked for kids who got polio. And very few of them, we got serum and looked for neutralizing antibodies. So I agree, it would be very interesting. But for measles, there might be more recent information, actually. And I do mean to look into that. Yeah. I like this. Community immunity. Very good. <laughs> so in the U.S., a lot of people don't want to be vaccinated because we have plenty of vaccine for everyone. We're only at 60-some percent. Other countries don't have the vaccine, which is a shame. And both are issues that you have to deal with. Okay, enough enough politics. Should I get the vaccines even with Omicron spreading? Yes, of course. They will protect you against severe disease. Will current immunity... Yes, you will be protected against severe disease and death. And for sure, transmission is reduced after vaccination, even against the variants. So to think it's not is absurd. And I know some people are saying that, but they're just not correct. I'm wondering how many shots I'll need to avoid mild flu-like symptoms. Oh, so that's a good question. Um, I don't know. Let's see. A lot of people have been boosted in the U.S. and other countries. Let's see if I mean, for six months that will eliminate mild symptoms because it will protect against infection. But then we'll see what it does after that. Um, it's very interesting. If you want to see a cool interview about smallpox eradication, I did one with Don Henderson, D.A. Henderson, a number of years ago. He's, de he's dead now, but uh, the interview lives on. It's really good. How do we identify T cell versus B cell epitopes? Well, you can take peptides from, the, let's take a spike protein. You take, you make overlapping peptides, 20 amino acid overlap, you have them synthesized, and then you can add them to B cells or add them to antibodies. The antibodies are the proteins that bind the B cell epitopes. And for T cell epitopes, you take, T you take lymphocytes from people, you put them in culture, and you add the peptides, and if there is a T cell with a receptor that binds the peptide, a T cell epitope, the T cell will get activated, and you can measure the production of um, certain cytokines that are measures of activation of T cells. Do we know if the COVID vaccines prevent long COVID? Uh, anecdotal evidence so far, Daniel Griffin claims that they do seem to prevent long COVID, but it's never going to be 100%, of course, right?
Uh, this seems to be a legitimate science question as opposed to a lot of the political ones. If uh, if I didn't have any reaction, does that mean my redactive response is, is not? No, it doesn't at all. They're, they're not related uh, at all. And you most likely did react, although, again, not everybody re reacts well. Yes, Ed, you're right. A lot of people like to play pretend scientists. And, you know, the problem is uh, many people go outside of their specialty. Like cardiologists think that they know all about viral infections now. <laughs> Amazing. They've become experts. I think the emphasis on only preventing severe is a little bougie for the working poor. Uh, that's the way it is, kitten. That's the facts. That's how these vaccines work. They don't prevent a mild infection. F flu vaccines though, don't prevent mild infections. And probably the boost you get from the mild infection is really good. I don't know what it would take to get uh, to prevent infection. The, the human papillomavirus vaccines apparently prevent infection. Uh, by maintaining high levels of uh, mucosal antibodies. I don't know how you do that. I'm not sure that they plan that. I've been thinking about that recently, and it would I think it would be really hard because you need to have high levels of mucosal antibodies to prevent infection, and I think that is very difficult to do. What accounts for the differences of how individuals react? Nobody knows. Obviously, you know, genetically, we're all different. Every one of us is different from the next. So you have different amino acids and all the proteins that are important for the immune response. And so... So that's clearly, it's clearly controlled on a genetic basis, but exactly what? We have no idea. So it is a race between how fast your body gears up, what delays it, interferon response. People with interferon responses, good interferon responses, are very good at keeping down viral loads early on and having milder infections and letting the adaptive response do its job. All right, let's go back to um, the quiz and we'll check out what you guys did so far. All right, so the herd immunity emphasizes that not everyone must be immune to protect a population. Uh, livestock, no, that's just a joke, a funny. <laughs> not everyone must be immune. Uh, group think, no, yes, and all the above is not correct. Okay, good, not bad. Not bad. Okay, look at that. Ian Lipkin is calling me, but he doesn't realize I'm teaching class, so I'm not going to answer his call. Let's talk about the nuts and bolts of vaccines. Uh, vaccines can be either active or passive. This is the definition, folks. Active means we give you a modified form of the pathogen or a part of it. So you don't get disease, but you make an immune response. That gives you a long-term protection. So the COVID vaccines are active vaccines. The ones, the mRNA vaccines, the vectored vaccines, the protein-based and activated, they are active. Active meaning your immune response kicks into gear and you get memory. Whereas passive is you give the products of the immune response to the recipient, the products of the immune response. Now, you could, in theory, give antibodies or immune cells, but mostly we give antibodies, and this gives you short-term protection. And an example here is this vial, rabies immune globulin. This is taken from people who um, are immunized with rabies vaccine. We then take serum from them and uh, make sure it's safe, and then it's given to people. If you have a rabies, if you're bitten, uh, you will get an injection of this antibody at the bite site to neutralize virus. This gives you short-term protection because it's just antibodies. There's no memory involved. So that's what is a passive vaccine. It's still called a passive vaccine. Monoclonal antibody therapy, convalescent plasma therapy. Now, each of us gets a natural passive vaccine from our mothers. Here is uh, a timeline of conception uh, fetal development, birth, all the way through adult years on the y-axis. And on the x, 
I'm sorry, on the x-axis and on the y-axis, the fraction of adult values. And so uh, as you are developing in utero, your mother passes IgG to you through the placenta. And so the red line is uh, passively transferred maternal IgG, uh, which obviously peaks at birth because she can't give you any more <laughs> after, your, after we cut uh, the, um, the, the umbilicus. That's it. No more. You're cut off. And so your IgG levels decline. That is maternal. However, you start to develop your own. Develop your own IgM and IgG. And uh, the maternal antibodies last between six and nine months. And then you have your own. And as you uh, get on in years, you get better and better at making your own. So you get your mother's experience with uh, her infections over the years. So that is a passive vaccine. It's a natural passive vaccine. Uh, there are a number of wonderful stories about passive therapy with convalescent serum. This is one of my favorite. This is from the book Fever, which I read in the 70s, and it inspired me to become a virologist. Highly recommended. Uh, so the, the, the uh, Penny Pinio here uh, was a nurse working in uh, Nigeria where the first cases of Lassa virus hemorrhagic fever were noted in the 60s. Uh, and a couple of the nurses died. Now, Penny uh, survived, and she was brought to uh, Columbia Presbyterian Hospital, actually, uh, near, near where I work, um, to recover. And she recovered in the hospital. They just flew her back on a plane <laughs> with, with no, with no uh, uh, containment whatsoever. Um, and um, at, meanwhile, uh, Jordi Casals was a virologist at Yale, who uh, was working on the virus, and he infected himself. And so he lived uh, near Columbia Presbyterian. So they, he went to the hospital, and they actually gave him uh, serum from the nurse who had survived, uh, and he survived. And who knows whether it was because of the serum or not. It was just the right thing to do. But this is a wonderful story of convalescent serum. Um, fast forward to the Ebola virus uh, outbreaks, uh, a very famous cocktail of monoclonals called ZMAP, uh, three different monoclonals against the Ebola virus glycoprotein. Here's this is a model of the glycoprotein in white and uh, and, and blue or purple, red, and yellow are the three different monoclonal binding sites. Uh, and this is a th these monoclonals were raised in mice and then humanized. That is, uh, the the IgG1 scaffold from humans was used to replace that of the mouse. So it's mostly human now, and that was given to patients. Not clear if it helped them at all in the Ebola virus outbreak 2015, but it got a lot of publicity. And so companies then began working on making these monoclonals. And of course, when SARS-CoV-2 emerged, uh, many companies jumped into that. Uh, in many cases, they have isolated B cells of patients who have recovered and cloned out the antibody genes from them, showed that they bind the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 and neutralize infectivity. And these include uh, famous ones like BAM-lanivimab. If it ends in a MAB, it's a monoclonal antibody, which needs to be given mostly intravenously, although there's some exceptions now. So difficult therapy uh, to deliver. So here's a model of um, the receptor binding domain of uh, of the spike that's that's in green here. Uh, and uh, it's, unfortunately, it's in white in this picture, and it binds ACE2, of course. And then this is one monoclonal that binds the receptor binding domain and interferes with ACE2 binding. So this has been infused extensively uh, in the COVID pandemic, and many companies are making uh, these monoclonals. And as variants have emerged uh, over the past year or so, uh, many of the monotherapies with monoclonals have been rendered ineffective. And so... Um, we have had to make cocktails, and we'll see what the changes in Omicron do. So this is one of the outcomes of Omicron and the variants is that it can make monoclonal therapy uh, less effective. So moving back to active vaccines, what are some of the requirements to make a good vaccine? Well, we have to make – we have to induce an appropriate immune response. So remember we talked about uh, viruses inducing Th1 – uh, versus Th2 responses, the CD4 cells uh, that produce specific cytokines, if, they, if they're Th1 CD4 cells, this uh, favors the, the elaboration of cytokines that produce 
uh, CTLs, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, or the TH2 response, uh, those CD4s are making cytokines that help uh, B cells to make their antibody. So you have to make the right response, whether it's a mix or mostly one or the other. So you, you should know whether you need antibodies or T cells uh, to protect against disease. And secondly, a vaccinated individual must be protected against disease caused by a virulent form of the pathogen, protected against disease. Just getting a, an antibody response isn't enough. And so many studies come out where they measure antibody responses and say, oh, look, we have a high antibody response. It doesn't matter if it doesn't protect you against infection. That's why the vaccine trials initially phase one and two measure antibody and T cell responses. But then in phase three, you actually measure what the immunization does in terms of disease, because that's the outcome. You have to protect people against disease. And so that, that is what uh, has been done, of course, for COVID and for all the other vaccines that we've licensed. Other requirements for a vaccine has to be safe, of course. Can't cause the disease it's meant to prevent. It has to have minimal side effects. Now, this is why we do extensive testing, phase one, phase two, phase three, and then post-approval, post-emergency use authorization, post-licensure. You continue to collect information on side effects. Uh, the, the vaccine has to induce protective immunity, that is, protect against the development of disease in the population, and the protection must be long-lasting. Uh, we don't know about long-lasting right now. We don't know about five years, 10 years. We can't. It's only been a few years for COVID vaccines. But for other vaccines, we know some of them are long-lasting and others are not. The influenza vaccines are not long-lasting, particularly in the elderly. And so we can do better with those. We also re would like our vaccines to be cheap. WHO wants them to be less than a dollar a dose so that more people can get them globally. They should be genetically stable. That is, if you have an infectious vaccine, it should not revert. And we'll talk about that today. Storage. It would be nice if you didn't have to keep it on dry ice, which was the case for initial COVID vaccines. It would be nice if you could keep it in the refrigerator. And it would be nice uh, if you could get away from needles. Oral delivery is great, but obviously... Most of the vaccines we're using now are not orally delivered, but we'll talk about some uh, ways to get around needles uh, in a bit. Uh, this, by the way, on the bottom here is a doer. It's a bottle, a large bottle. You can see the size of it here, uh, which the WHO developed. Uh, they put a dry ice into it, and it keeps vaccines frozen for a long period of time so they could be delivered to remote locations, and you don't need to have a freezer. So let's talk now about different kinds of vaccines and how to, how to make them, how they work. This slide shows you all of the ways that uh, approved human uh, vaccines, with one exception, have been made, um, starting with, say, a parental virulent virus. Um, we have um, a medical need identified, uh, and um, we have different ways to make vaccines. So, for example, we can make replication-competent attenuated virus vaccines. Uh, these viruses actually reproduce in you, but they don't cause disease. They induce immunity. We can make inactivated vaccines. We can fractionate the virus into components and make a subunit vaccine. These are non-recombinant ways here, all of these three, uh, which just depend on growing virus. And then we have a lot of Newer, newer mechanisms that uh, depend on cloning or at least on nucleic acids. For example, we can use other viruses to vector uh, components to make a vaccine, and we've seen that with adenovirus vectors and other, other viruses um, uh, can be used as vectors as well. Uh, you can make DNA vaccines. You can put the, the relevant gene, the, the protein a coding gene that you want to be your antigen into a plasmid of DNA, and that would be a DNA vaccine. Those have been trialed in humans, but none are licensed in humans. There are DNA vaccines for animals, though. Of course, now we have a brand new component here, an mRNA vaccine, which was not on this slide in the first years of this course. This is a brand new 
uh, vaccine in humans, and now uh, multiple ones have been approved, as you know. And then you can produce the proteins in various expression systems, like cells in culture. It could be insect cells, yeast. It could be eukaryotic cells. Uh, and you can make protein subunit vaccines. Uh, or in some cases, the individual proteins produced will assemble into an empty capsid. We call those virus-like particle vaccines. So I want to go through and talk about examples of uh, each of these. These are the viral vaccines that are uh, licensed in the U.S. And on the left is the, is the table from the textbook, which was published. The fifth edition came out just as, as the pandemic was unfolding. So we didn't have any COVID vaccines to put on this. But, of course, subsequently, uh, we do have uh, COVID vaccines. We have one uh, which is licensed by the FDA community, uh, an mRNA vaccine. And then we have uh, these two in the U.S., Moderna mRNA and the J&J vectored vaccine, which have uh, emergency use authorizations. There's also a, um, a an Ebola virus vaccine, or Vibo, which is a VSV vectored Ebola virus spike like a protein, uh, which is, is approved actually for use in the U.S. and is often used uh, where there are outbreaks in Africa. But here are the more traditional vaccines. You can see them all listed here on the left. Uh, the kind of vaccine, whether it's attenuated, inactivated, yeast-produced recombinant protein, et cetera, uh, indications for use. Many of these are uh, universal vaccination of kids, or infants, or, or children, as you can see. Some are for laboratory workers. Uh, varicella zoster is for adults 60 years and older. Yellow fever in the U.S. is for travel to areas where there is yellow fever. Um, adenovirus vaccines just for military recruits. And the number of doses. Some of them are one, uh, some of them are two, and some of them uh, are three. This is uh, a good summary. We're going to cover some of these in some detail. So in activated vaccines, you take the parental virus and you treat it with chemicals, which will destroy its infectivity. And the chemicals include uh, formalin, beta-propiolactone, non-ionic detergents, which eliminate infectivity, but the antigenicity of the preparation is not compromised, right? You have to test that in, in experimental animals to make sure that whatever you're doing maintains the antigenicity uh, of the vaccines. And one of the inactivated vaccines I want to talk about is um, polio, the one for poliomyelitis, uh, this is an acute virus infection that we've discussed before uh, and was once very common uh, in the U.S., as, as shown by this description in this 1959 textbook of medicine. In the U.S., cases of polio rose to a peak in the, in the 50s. The, uh, the virus was first seen in the U.S. in the early 1900s, uh, outbreaks, larger and larger outbreaks occurring, and then the baby, the post World War II baby boomers, of course, contributed to this. These large spikes of over 50,000 cases uh, a year in the U.S. Hospitals were full of iron lungs because often the ability to breathing breathe was compromised. And of course, FDR uh, contracted polio in his 30s and could not walk without braces uh, and often was in a wheelchair. And so he raised money to fund development of the two polio vaccines that we use today. There was no NIH at the time. Uh, most of the money used to develop uh, the two polio vaccines were from private donors. The inactivated vaccine is poliovirus treated with formalin to destroy infectivity. It was given a huge clinical trial in 1954, 1.8 million children, uh, half placebo, half vaccinated, and the results were announced on April 12th, 1955, just over 50% protection against paralysis. There was no PCR at the time, no way to measure infection. It was simply paralysis. Now, this was a huge trial. 1.8 million children is amazing. The largest uh, single trial ever done. Probably will never do a, a single trial of this size again. It was done before computers, so all the data had to be kept on index cards. Can you imagine keeping it all straight? But I also want to point out 50% uh, protection isn't great, but 
That's what we would have accepted for COVID vaccines. If you remember, the FDA director said, we will take, we will license anything that's safe and over 50% protection against COVID. Uh, but we got much luckier for COVID. Uh, but this is this was initially not great, but it was licensed. And uh, you can see the headlines because polio was a very visible disease. It paralyzed kids. Unfortunately, within a few months after licensure of this vaccine, uh, kids started getting polio, apparently from the vaccine itself. This was called the Cutter incident, where one company, Cutter Laboratories, that made the vaccine did not inactivate it properly. And so kids were being inoculated with infectious virus. So that was eventually fixed and the vaccine distribution resumed. But uh, a lot of the current day anti-vaccine litigation derives from uh, the, the Cutter incident. So the way this vaccine works is it induces the production of uh, antibodies and T-cells, which circulate in the blood, of course. And so when you are infected with polio, you ingest the virus. It reproduces in your mucosal surfaces, spreads to the blood. And in about 1% of cases, the virus gets into the central nervous system and causes paralysis. IPV-induced uh, antibodies will interrupt the virus in the blood so it does not get into the CNS and it prevents paralysis. But as you see, the vaccine does not prevent infection. It prevents disease. So when we talk about herd immunity, uh, we have to talk about reducing levels of spread to protect other individuals. This vaccine introduced in 1955 reduced uh, polio to a few thousand cases in the U.S. I also want to talk about the influenza virus inactivated vaccine. Uh, influenza viruses, as we discussed, occur in three types. They're envelope viruses, uh, negative stranded segmented RNA genomes, and the viral envelope contains two major spike proteins, the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. Uh, we make an inactivated influenza vaccine because there can be up to 49,000 deaths a year in the U.S. alone as a consequence of influenza. And the traditional vaccine originally developed actually in the 1930s by Jonas Salk uh, and others is virus grown in embryonated chicken eggs. It's inactivated with formalin. Uh, and then disrupted, uh, and this uh, is uh, injected intramuscularly. We manufacture almost 100 million doses each year. It's about 60% effective in healthy children and, and uh, adults less than 65. As you get older, it becomes less and less effective. Obviously, this is an area that needs some more research. And protection correlates with antibodies to the HA and the NA, the viral glycoproteins. And so uh, as we'll see, as the virus changes antigenically, we keep monitoring uh, neutralization or antibodies to those proteins to decide whether we need to make a new kind of vaccine. We now can make uh, vaccines in cell culture. For example, flu cell vax does not get made in eggs. It gets made in cells and culture. Now, the problem with the, with the flu vaccine is that the envelope proteins change each year. And so you have to select uh, – actually, uh, this should be uh, – Every almost every year, in the first few months of each year, we need to select what variants are going to be used to make the vaccine. Uh, these are antigenically changed viruses that are more fit than the previous influenza viruses, so they displace them. And this, this is we know for influenza why uh, more why more fit viruses displace previous ones because they are antigenic variants and they evade uh, immunity. And so we have to reformulate the vaccine almost on a yearly basis. And what we do is we say, okay, what hemagglutinin and neuraminidase genes do we need? We then make reassortments uh, of a virus that grows really well, a high-yielding strain in either eggs or in cell culture. And, for example, the 2021-22 egg-based vaccine has four different components. It's a quadrivalent vaccine. It has an H1N1 virus. It has an H3N2 virus and it has two different B lineages. So influenza A and B viruses are the ones we vaccinate against, not against influenza C. The cell-based vaccines are slightly different from this. So it's a quadrivalent vaccine. And selection of the vaccine is hard. It begins uh, at the beginning of every year. So the WHO, the Global Influenza Surveillance Network, surveillance, carries out surveillance for influenza virus globally all year round. They collect uh, isolates from laboratories everywhere. They ask, uh, how are these neutralized by 
sec- from serum from patients, and they decide whether we have to change the viruses or not every year. So in the first few months, they select the strains for that year. They prepare high-yielding reassortants. They standardize the amount of antigen, uh, assign the potency, and then it gets packaged so that you can start vaccinating in the fall, in September. And so then we vaccinate through our flu season here in the Northeast uh, through uh, March or so. And, and then the next year, we have to start over again uh, to uh, decide whether we need a new vaccine. And we've been doing this for many, many years. And there's a nice twiv there on uh, how strains are selected. Now, the problem is that influenza viruses undergo antigenic drift. Here's the model of the hemagglutinin. And the top is where the hemagglutinin binds its cell receptor sialic acid. And these colored areas are epitopes. They're B-cell epitopes. These are the places where antibodies bind and they can block infection. And you only need one amino acid change in any of these epitopes to reduce the ability of antibodies to neutralize infection and prevent severe disease. So again, these vaccines don't prevent infection. They prevent severe disease. But when we see a reduction in neutralization, that we know is a correlate for having more severe disease. And so we change the vaccine. Uh, These colored areas on the stem of the HA vary much less. These are more conserved regions and as we'll see in a bit, those might be candidates for a universal flu vaccine. Now let's go to our next question here, which is, which statement about inactivated viral vaccines is incorrect? A, chemicals can be used to inactivate infectivity. B, they do not replicate. C, they can be dangerous if inactivation is not complete. D, antigenic variation can make them ineffective. E, none of the above are incorrect. Okay, let's see. Let's see if I can remember. I forgot to mark where we ended up. So let's see if I can guess. Uh, will the deer reach herd immunity? Yes, they will. Apparently, over at least in Iowa, the one study done there, over 70% of the deer have been infected. So uh, that yeah, that will explain, you know, crashes of the of the virus. So when much of the population is immune, then you have a crash. And then some new deer are born. Maybe there's some mixing, and then you can have another outbreak. But yes, herd immunity applies for, for deer, and there are no anti-vax deer as far as I know. They don't object to being infected. These questions were already done. Here we go. Okay, the bougie. Yes, there we go. That was the last one. Well, prevent infection. We answered that. Is it possible to have side effects without the benefits of a vaccine? So this, most of the side effects are caused by innate responses, right? Making cytokines inflammation. So they don't really reflect the adaptive response. And so you, you could, they could, they're completely decoupled in a way. Yeah. I don't know if I answered this. It's a race between how fast your body gears up, what delays it. Well, it takes time, right? It takes a couple of days for those B cells to get activated and for the T cells to get activated to proliferate, and then you have enough of them. It's not going to be instantaneous. But that's the way the uh, immune system has evolved. So apparently it's okay to delay them because, or or their, their delay is acceptable because then you can prevent severe disease and death, and that's really the goal, right? Okay, so we'll, we'll highlight this. The, the refinement on herd immunity. Pockets play a role. Yes, 
the assumption is that herd immunity means everybody is 70%, but it's never that. There are always pockets, and that makes a big difference. Has the COVID have the new strains mutated enough to bypass vaccine coverage? I, I we don't know honestly yet, but I I heard a talk last night which tells me that all the most of the T cell epitopes are not changed in Omicron, so you're going to be protected against severe disease and death. But we need to collect the information, of course. Uh, would a CRISPR approach that incorporates spike into the DNA of the host? I don't think we should put spike into our DNA. I think we can do it without having to modify it because we don't know what the consequences would be. I'm participating in an immunity study. They're inviting me to take samples before and after my booster shot. Uh, ask them if they are going to study. Well, they're not going to be able to answer this because the people giving you the shot don't know much about it which is not to impugn them. They just don't know. But you might ask them what they're going to measure. They're not just antibodies and B cells. What aspects? Are they going to look at antibody affinity, the ability to neutralize all variants, for example? But I, I don't think they can tell you that. Do tertiary immune responses, is just with a booster, last longer than secondary? Um, so, so the responses always contract. The key is that what you have made is slightly different, like the antibodies are slightly different and the T cells are slightly different, recognizing so the antibodies may be higher affinity, for example. But you, the memory is the key there, and um, that lasts in most cases, but not always, of course. So the uh, passive vaccination you're getting against rabies is not long-lived. That's right. The antibodies they give you do not last more than a few months. If someone has a significant reaction to a vaccine, is it safe to assume they would have the na same reaction to a natural infection? Uh, no. Uh, th this has been emphasized over and over, actually, that they're, the two are, are disconnected. Um, because the initial reactions, for example, well, the, the very earliest reactions are inflammatory based. Uh, and uh, a vaccine is different from the actual agent. So I don't think we understand why, but they are different for sure. Yes, the mother, uh, as long as they're breastfeeding, can also pass antibodies. That's right. So they don't, they obviously no longer go through the umbilicus, but yes, breast milk will do it if you're, if you're breastfeeding. Are CT levels lower in vax? Absolutely. Absolutely. CT levels are lower. Viral load, RNA loads much lower in vaccinated people, no matter what the variant is. Are there anti antibodies? Oh, so yes, there are. Uh, you can. So if you give a person a mouse antibody, they will make antibodies against uh, the mouse antibody, the mouse protein. Um, and in fact, that's a good way to identify the epitope. Those are called idiotypic, anti idiotypic antibodies, but. The passive uh, vaccines are humanized, so they're they're considered self. They're human antibodies. Hmm. Uh, this. SARS-CoV-2 monoclonals are to the spike. Why not choose another site, the RBD? Well, we didn't know initially, right? And the, the RBD would be the, the logical place because you need it to attach to ACE2. So if you block it with an antibody, you're going to block infectivity. We didn't realize that uh, we would have so much antigenic variation. 
Now, in, in retrospect, obviously, yes, there are parts of, of the spike that are less variant, and maybe we should make uh, an, an, antibodies to those for sure. Thank you very, Nika, for your contribution. I really appreciate it. Is there a working vaccine for prevention of uh, VZV? Yes, there's a shingles vaccine. So if you were infected like I was before the vaccine, you can get a shingles vaccine to prevent shingles, and that's available. It's called Shingrix. Of the 1,200 or so amino acids in the spike, what defines B from T cell? Well, it's functional. You have to make the peptides and ask which bind to antibody and which to bind to T cells. There are other rules as well, but that's how you do it. You do it functionally, and then once you identify them, then you can say, do they change in any of the variants? How does giving uh, vulnerable people prophylactic monoclonals compare with giving them boosters? Well, the problem is that they may not respond. Maybe their illness prevents them from making a good immune response. And so, um, and often you don't know that because you're not testing them. So if a vulnerable person gets infected, you want to give them monoclonals just to make sure, even if they've been boosted, you want to make sure they don't get severe disease. So monoclonals are indicated there. Uh, micro patches are coming up. Thank you, Elsie, for your contributions. Really appreciate it. Why aren't all the vaccines fully approved? Because the FDA requires a lot of data. And so for those of you who say they're not being tested enough, that is the key. Wasn't the risk uh, rise of polio due to better hygiene, which prevented infants to get the disease while still protected by mom's immunity? Yes. Didn't we discussed that in I don't know, one, of, one of the sessions before. Yes, that's absolutely right. I'm glad you remember. <laughs> you got your, your polio vaccine on a sugar cube. So did I. That's the attenuated vaccine that we're going to talk about shortly. Cutter incident is the Salk vaccine, improperly inactivated. What, what level of side effects is considered unacceptable? Anything beyond the ones that they ask you about, pain, the most common one is pain at the injection site, soreness in the arm, fever, loss of appetite, malaise, headache. Any, anything beyond that is considered unacceptable. For example, uh, myocarditis would be unacceptable. Fortunately, it's treatable in a low frequency. Uh, death, obviously, would be unacceptable, but the vaccines are not causing death. The, vac the only vaccine I know that prevents infection is the human papillomavirus vaccine. Measles may actually depress it quite a bit, but I need to look at those data. Could we develop an infectious vaccine? Yes, that's what we're going to talk about next. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Unfortunately, I have to move on, but let's... Uh, uh, why are rhino vaccines not possible? Uh, because there are too many genotypes, and we haven't figured out to put them all together, but people are working on that, so I, I don't think it's going to be impossible. Thank you, John, for your contribution. Uh, really appreciate it. Well, let's go back to the uh, quiz now so we can move on. Uh, which statement about inactivated vaccines is incorrect? None of the above. Chemicals can be used to inactivate infectivity. They do not replicate. They can be dangerous if inactivation is not complete, and variation can make them ineffective. Those are all correct. All right, let's uh, move on to subunit vaccines. Here you either take the virus and break it up and put take the pieces, maybe purify them like spike and inject them, or you produce the proteins by recombinant DNA methods. You put the appropriate gene 
in some kind of a cell, and you can get proteins or you can get virus-like particles. Um, and usually when you do the, the latter, and in both cases, you're looking for some kind of a capsid protein or a membrane protein of the virus. So Shingrix, which came up already, is an example. Uh, this is a zoster vaccine. So this is for older people like me who had chicken pox as a kid. And so uh, I'm, I'm at risk for getting shingles, which I've already had. Um, but we can immunize you. And Shingrix is a single glycoprotein. <laughs> this virus, varicella zoster virus, has about 12 gly membrane glycoproteins. And so one of them, uh, GE, is made in, in uh, mammalian cells and culture. It's then purified. It's mixed with an adjuvant, ASO1, and it's injected. And this is a really, really good vaccine. It, it uh, does a great job at preventing shingles. Another example of a, a subunit vaccine is the hepatitis B virus vaccine. It's the surface antigen protein produced in yeast. So here's our hepatitis B virus particle uh, with its envelope and the viral uh, surface antigen in the in the envelope. So you take the gene for that, you produce it in cells and culture, and it assembles into empty particles like these that have no DNA, highly immunogenic, uh, and this is done in yeast. Papillomavirus vaccine is also a virus-like particle vaccine. Now, papillomaviruses we've talked about briefly uh, during our transformation session, but these are viruses that cause warts, over 170 types in people. Warts can be all over your body, and they can also be sex. These viruses can be sexually transmitted. In fact, they are the most common sexually transmitted disease in the U.S. Uh, the ones that are sexually transmitted can cause low-risk genital warts. Uh, others are high risk because they can cause cancers by the mechanisms we talked about when we talked about uh, transformation. And these can cause a variety of cancers, cervix, vagina, penis, anus, oral pharyngeal cancer, uh, in the U.S., about 31,000 a year, mostly types 16 and 18, but there are other types as well. And about half of Americans are actually infected with these genital HPV types, which go from 18 to 59. Now, again, not all of them cause cancers. Uh, but here's a breakdown of men and women uh, in the U.S. Uh, in terms of who, uh, what percentage of people are uh, infected with HPVs. So the vaccines uh, are empty capsid vaccines. You take this, the gene encoding the major capsid protein. You produce the uh, protein in, in yeast or insect cells. The protein assembles into empty capsids. You purify them, and they are inoculated intramuscularly uh, with an adjuvant, and they give rise to high levels of antibodies in the um, mucosal layers of the reproductive tract and they protect against infection. And there are a number of uh, HPV vaccines made. The Gardasil by Merck has four types made in yeast, and then they expanded it to nine types, Gardasil 9. And then GSK makes Cerverix. It's two types made in insect cells. And ideally, these are given before you get sexually active, right? Because uh, once you're sexually active, your likelihood of being infected goes way up. I talked about ways to improve influenza vaccines. And so one way is to make virus-like particles. It turns out that if you make just the hemagglutinin in protein in cells, you can have particles made like this one. This looks like an influenza virus, except it's empty. There's no nucleic acid. At least there's no influenza virus RNA in it. And it's just a, a row of HA in this membrane uh, particle. And they're quite immunogenic. Uh, this has been done actually in plants. You can make the flu HA in plants. Uh, you can introduce the HA. You can make transgenic plants, or you could transiently produce the protein. Uh, and then uh, Nucociana benthamiomena is also often used for this because it can be genetically manipulated. And then you simply take the fluid. You crush the leaves and take the fluid, and you can harvest these particles. It's very effective. Uh, one square meter makes 20,000 doses of vaccine, so it's under 20 cents a dose. Whereas if you're growing flu vaccines in eggs, one egg is needed to make a single dose of vaccine. So this is in human trials, 
uh, and I think the the uh, efficacy is not better than egg grown influenza virus, so that's a problem. But it is cheaper and fast. Now all of these subunit vaccines have pros and cons. They're fast. There's no genomes. There's no infectious virus. These are all advantages, but they are expensive. They have to be injected, and they have poor antigenicity. Why do they have poor antigenicity? Well, they don't replicate. They don't infect, right? They, they cannot cause inflammation, or at least they cannot do it very well. So if you remember, uh, agents that don't cause inflammation have poor activation of adaptive responses. And so we often require an adjuvant to mimic the inflammatory effects of an infection. An exception is a poliovirus, an activated polio vaccine, doesn't need an adjuvant. It's quite good on its own, and it may be that the RNA is part of the adjuvant uh, of the particle. The adjuvants um, produce essentially a more uh, robust adaptive response, and one way they do that is by stimulating inflammation, but they also help to concentrate the antigen at the site of inoculation so it doesn't diffuse away as quickly, and, and we think that may happen, help uh, immunogenicity as well. And here are four different licensed adjuvants, for example, aluminum hydroxide or aluminum phosphate. This is in the HBV vaccine in the U.S. Uh, Shingrix and others use AS1, which is monophosphorolipid A, right here, that's a ligand for TLR4. So this is an, an agonist of the ligand. It binds to TLR4 and stimulates signaling in the production of cytokines. So it stimulates inflammation. AS4 is in the HPV vaccine, Cervarix, which is alum plus monophosphorolipid A. And then uh, MF59 is a squalene oil and water emulsion, which is mainly used in Europe. That's what it looks like down there. Uh, someone asked about the microneedle patch, which is in trials. And uh, this is a promising technology where you embed the antigen on this, this uh, synthetic patch. It has very, very tiny needles. And then you place it on the skin, on the shoulder, for example, with a Band-Aid. And the antigen is delivered to the epidermis, which is a very good place uh, to deliver antigen. No needle needed, no, no training to deliver a needle based vaccine. So I would say this, uh, if this works for all the injected vaccines, eventually it will replace needles uh, globally, probably. On the right is a experiment where we're looking at thermostabilization, right? We have to keep vaccines cold or frozen, and that's a problem. And so here we're looking at uh, infectivity of an influenza virus vaccine with days in storage. And if you store the vaccine at uh, 40 degrees Celsius, within two days you have uh, no infectivity left. But if you add sugars, you can dry the vaccine in a certain way that includes sugars. They stabilize uh, the vaccine against high temperatures. And this kind of technology is being extensively developed. And I think between these two, we're going to see real big changes in uh, vaccine deployment. Influenza viruses change every year, as we discussed, and so there's a lot of work to try and make what we would call a universal influenza vaccine. The HA, as I told you, consists of a head, a head region where the epitopes uh, for antibody binding are the ones that vary, and then there are stem region epitopes that are highly conserved. So the problem is the stem region is immunosubdominant. In other words, when you are infected with an influenza virus or you get an influenza virus vaccine, most of the antibodies you make are against the head of the HA. So how do we direct the immune response to the stem? Well, here's one strategy that's being explored. We make chimeric hemagglutinins where the stem shown in green is, is from a human uh, influenza virus and you want to induce antibodies against it. And then you put a, a different HA head on this, which comes from a virus that never infects humans. So in this case, it's an H9 and uh, head, and you immunize people, and you get a lot of antibodies to the head and a few to the stem, and then you boost them with an H8-1, where the head is different now, 
And so now instead of getting a big memory response to the head, you're getting a, a memory response to the stem. And then you repeat it with a third head. And the idea here is that you amplify uh, the memory to the stem epitopes. And this kind of approach uh, is in testing. All right, it is time for a uh, question. I think I have to, let me turn that on first. What are some requirements for an effective vaccine? Low cost, ease of administration, provides long-lasting immunity, minimal side effects, all of the above. Let's take a couple of questions here. Are there any lectures on gene therapy? Well, latent virus infections we did last week, and gene therapy is, is the last lecture in this course. Are, are flu vaccines grown in cell culture inactivated with similar methods to egg culture? Yes, they are formalin, beta, propiolactone. Uh, no, one is, they're comparable. Uh, the cell culture and the egg grown are comparable in inducing protection against disease, and it's not great. It's 60%, so we can do better. How do we test that a, a vaccine has actually been activated? So you have to measure infectivity. You have to put your vaccine in cells, in culture, in the lab, and you have to have an, a very sensitive assay to make sure that you're picking up very, very low numbers of virus. You can't do a PCR. It has to be infectivity. If vaccines prevent severe disease, what's herd immunity about? So it's cutting down transmission. It's reducing transmission because people who are vaccinated shed much less virus, much less likely to infect someone else. That's the key. So it's not, you're not blocking infection, but you're causing much less shedding. Is there some advantage of inactivated virus vaccine versus spike or, yeah, so... That's a good question. Obviously, the inactivated virus vaccine, you're, you're giving more antigens than just spike. And it's probably easy to grow it and inactivate it. But on the other hand, the mRNA vaccine technology, the vector technology is also quite flexible as well. The numbers with some of the inactivated vaccines are good, but the real key is going to be the longevity, and we don't know that yet. How does viral fitness affect the effectiveness of a vaccine? So that's a good question. So it depends what is causing the improved fitness. I can imagine a number. So the main one that might affect vaccine efficacy would be epitopes, right? If the T cell epitopes change, then that would lead to more severe disease. But so far, that hasn't been the case. And we actually don't know what's causing the improved fitness of the variants as they arise. It could be antigenic fitness, but it could be other things as well. So I would say that um, we not necessarily, in the case of influenza virus, the improved fitness is due to antigenic variation, and that's why we have to replace the vaccine every year. Do animal vaccines ever find their way into humans? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I'm not aware of any at first thought. <laughs> Is there a benefit to getting a booster of a different vaccine? I don't think so. I think the, well, the idea of the boosting strategy that it further broadens your antibody repertoire to include many variants. So I don't think putting a different one in matters. And I think also if you use the different virus for a booster, you're resetting your uh, immune response, so that may not good. I would rather you mature it further. Would it be possible to create monoclonals for prion? So prion is a self-protein, so uh, you don't want to do that because then you'll get pathology from that. Uh, so this is a good question that we had last time. Bonnie, thank you for asking because I didn't answer it well last time. So if getting a vaccine for one COVID variant protects against others, why doesn't our TMB cells do the same thing for flu? So I think that's because the flu vaccine isn't as effective at inducing the broad repertoire of B cells and T cells that you need, and the COVID vaccines are. So 
That's my stab at that. I think that's the explanation, yeah. Thank you, Rowan, for your uh, contribution. Really appreciate it. The mods are getting frustrated. I'm sorry. It's a tough job. Uh, do they expire? You mean on the shelf? Uh, yeah, they have a shelf life because they get, they're only tested for, say, a year. So you can't have a shelf life longer than a year. So, yes, they do. Well, HPV is only against those ser those types that are in the vaccine, right, which I listed on the slide. Is recombinant spike more expensive and labor-consuming to produce than an mRNA vaccine? Uh, yes, there are additional steps, right? You have to purify the protein, whereas with the mRNA vaccine, well, I suppose, you know, you have to wrap the mRNA vaccine in a lipid nanoparticle. So that's an extra step as well. But I, I think the protein purification is probably harder, yeah. I've had shingles twice. Any reason to get vaccinated? So the vaccine does have severe side effects. It can knock you out for a day, yes. Um, I, I think if you've had it twice, you're okay. I, I wouldn't get vaccinated, but that's my personal opinion. Should it be standard practice to, to cause a cut or abrasion at the time of all vaccine administration? No, because... Remember, most of the vaccines go deeper into the muscle, so doing a surface abrasion is not going to really help that. So, no. How are monoclonals made? Do they label B cells with fluorescently labeled spikes, separate, sequence? Yeah, basically that's it. It's slightly different, but that's the idea. They use uh, a spike to pull out B cells with the right antibody on their surface, single cell clone, get the gene out and make the antibody and test it to make sure it blocks infection, yeah. Could a intranasal vaccine prevent infection through the induction of uh, tissue resident memory T cells? I don't think it would prevent infection, but it might severely limit it, yeah. And I don't know how durable it would be though. That would be an interesting question. I mean, they're now testing peptide T cell vaccines, right? And uh, um, perhaps they could be given intranasally at some point. Yeah. So, uh, chance of making an HIV vaccine? We're going to talk a little bit about that. I think that we've tried a lot, and it's utterly failed in most cases. And so some people say it's a waste of, some scientists say it's a waste of time to continue. Others say we need to keep trying. I would like to see some new approaches rather than the same old prime boost strategies, frankly. None of those have, have worked at all. When you say 92% protected against severe disease and deaths, we should not differentiate by age and comorbidities. Yes, for sure. I would say the vast majority of people who die or get severe disease after being fully immunized are those with comorbidities and underlying uh, issues that prevent them from making a good immune response. Remember, we don't test everyone's immune response, so it may be that you simply didn't respond. So I think the propensity for that increases with age and comorbidities for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. When a virus is transmitted, when is the virus changed inside the host or when it comes in contact? So as it's reproducing in you, it's mutating. Every reproduction in every cell, new variants are produced, and your body may select for some that have a particular advantage. And then when they're transmitted, more selection occurs in the aerosols, the droplets, 
in the next person. So at every step, there is selection. Even if a virus is moving in a droplet in the air, one that has a more stable aspect could be selected for. So at every step, there is selection. That's the amazing thing about um, natural selection. Thank you, uh, Lynn, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Interesting. Most we got more people here uh, than um, <clears throat> we've had in a while. I guess vaccines. Uh, so according to Daniel Griffin, uh, these do not inhibit vaccine uh, effectiveness. Okay, let's go to question. The last question here. What's the answer? Uh, all of the above. Good. Hey, this is the first 100% question, I think. <laughs> uh, attenuated vaccines, there the virus is infectious. It, it, it reproduces, it stimulates an immune response, but mild or inapparent disease. Obviously, you don't want this vaccine to cause disease. So the idea is that, you know, in inactivated vaccines, you may need multiple doses to get a good, well-rounded, high-affinity immune response, but... And then replication-competent vaccine, it's self-amplifying. So maybe you need fewer doses because it's reproducing. In the old days, we made these empirically. What does that mean? Well, we would take your virus and simply infect different kinds of cells in culture. So here we take a human virus, we infect monkey cells and pass it from one monkey cell culture to another, selecting viruses that are better at reproducing in the monkey cell, for example, and then maybe they have... Uh, a difficult time reproducing in human cells uh, and they don't cause disease. So it's an empirical process. Uh, one example is flu mist. This is a replication competent uh, vaccine, influenza vaccines given intranasally, as you can see uh, for the little girl there. You, you don't put the needle on, of course. It's just a syringe without a needle. And these are reassortance of a master donor strains where you put in the HA and NA genes from your current virus that you want to immunize against. And the donor strains are cold adapted, temperature sensitive, and attenuated. So cold adapted means they reproduce really well in the nasopharynx, not in the lungs. And temperature sensitive means they don't reproduce well in the lung where the temperature is higher than in the nasopharynx. These produce protective immunity, but again, they're not much better overall than the inactivated vaccines. So I think we can still do better with influenza virus vaccines. Uh, the other poliovirus vaccine, Sabin oral poliovirus vaccine, OPV was introduced in 1962. And in most parts of the world where it's been used, it's led to eradication. You drink this virus, it goes through your stomach into your intestine, reproduces in the mucosa, uh, and then establishes immunity, mucosal immunity, as well as antibodies and T cells in the blood. And of course, these viruses do not, in most cases, get uh, into the CNS, although there are exceptions, as I'll show you. Now, Albert Sabin, there are three serotypes of polio. We, have a, we need to protect against all three, at least initially. So Sabin passaged all three serotypes, one, two, and three, in different animals and different cell cultures, and empirically at each step said, has it lost neurovirulence, the ability to cause paralysis? And eventually, after a decade or so of work, he found uh, three strains of OPP that were licensed in the U.S. in 1961. In the 80s, we were able to determine the mutations that he selected for in the vaccines. And here are his three vaccine types. They all have a single base change in the five prime non-coding region in common that are really important for attenuation. But you can see the type 2 and type 3 strains only have two base changes compared to the, the parental virus. And these kinds of vaccines would never be approved today uh, by the FDA. We've seen where these mutations are located previously. Here's the poliovirus genome. Uh, all three are in this 5' prime non-coding region, specifically in stem loop 5, which is expanded here. There's the change in the type 1 the type 2, and the type 3 Sabin strain. Amazingly, he selected for similar changes in all three of his vaccines. Unfortunately, 
these changes revert very quickly after you ingest the vaccine. So here is a time course where a child was given polio vaccine and then uh, virus in his uh, feces was sequenced at different times afterwards. So there's the Sabin vaccine. We're looking at the type 3, which has a U at 472. And uh, after 24 hours, the vaccine still has a U, but uh, 31 hours, 35 hours, now we have a mixture of U and C. And by 48 hours, two days after taking the vaccine, the U is now reverted to a C, and that reversion makes the virus neurovirulent. This is a lesion score in monkeys where you ask how uh, does the virus damage the central nervous system. You can see the vaccine has very low damage-causing ability, and the revertin now will cause paralysis. And this happens in most children who get the vaccine, and it is why uh, one in one and a half million of them develop paralysis uh, as a consequence of this polio vaccine. And since 1960s, at 61, 62, when we used switched to OPV in the U.S., there have been about 10 to 12 cases of paralytic disease a year shown by these gray bars caused by the vaccine. The last case of wild polio was in 1979. Last cases, that was the Amish outbreak in Pennsylvania. No more wild polio, only vaccine-associated polio. So we switched to IPV in 2000, and now no more vaccine-associated polio. Now, the WHO has declared that we should eradicate polio. Their goal was uh, to certify by 2005. We're not quite there yet for a variety of reasons, but we've made good progress. And that brings up the question, can you actually eradicate a viral disease? Well, smallpox has been eradicated, as you know, and there are two features essential for eradication. The virus can only be reproducing in one host, that is humans, and vaccination has to induce lifelong immunity. Those were the cases for smallpox. They're the case for polio and for measles, so those are all eradicable. And the polio eradication campaign has done very well. 1988, 125 polio endemic countries, the dark red. Ten years later, 40 polio endemic countries. Uh, another 10 years, five polio endemic countries. Uh, and today, wild polio only circulates in two countries, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And the number of cases are very small. This is the previous 12 months. You, know, you can see uh, just four. So there are fewer than 50 cases a year in those two countries. That's poliovirus type 1. Types 2 and 3 have been declared eradicated. Unfortunately, you can see there are other dots on this map. The green dots are vaccine-associated type 2 cases of polio, uh, and the orange are vaccine-associated type 1 polio. And so what happens is that when you use OPV, it's shed in the feces, it circulates, it reverts, and if you are not vaccinated, then you will have outbreaks of polio caused by the vaccine. And that's what's happened in this central region of Africa. These countries have allowed immunization to drop, and then they have outbreaks caused by the vaccine. So the, the key to this uh, is to try and prevent reversion. So a number of non-revertible poliovirus strains have been made by introducing changes in the 5' prime UTR to try and uh, prevent that. This S19 is the best candidate so far. Uh, this, a virus with those changes has actually been tested in humans. It's called new OPV2. Uh, it seems to be immunogenic, safe, and reverts far less than um, the, the parental OPV2. So it's likely that this will be introduced uh, in the coming months by WHO, and we'll see if it it gets rid of the vaccine-associated polio. However, as you know, even if we eradicate a virus, as long as we have the genome sequence, any virus can be recovered, whether it be polio virus or smallpox even, it's possible. Uh, we can also use recombinant DNA technology to engineer vaccines. I want to use as an example for this yellow fever uh, vaccine, the virus first identified in 1901, a mosquito-transmitted flavivirus that causes uh, high fatality in humans. Vaccine produced in 1938 by passaging of the virulent 
strain 176 times in chick embryo tissue. That was done by Max Tyler, the only Nobel Prize for a vaccine. And so far, half a billion doses have been distributed globally. So it's a safe and effective vaccine. So we have built on the success of this vaccine uh, by using it to make a dengue virus vaccine. So here is the yellow fever genome. Here are the encoded proteins. We can clone the genome of the vaccine strain, the yellow fever 17D vaccine, and substitute the structural proteins with those of dengue virus. We then can recover the vaccine in cell culture. And this has been licensed in certain countries as uh, Dengvaxia. So it's two structural proteins of dengue, four serotypes in the yellow fever backbone. It's been licensed in a few countries. Unfortunately, there is no protection against uh, dengue type 2, and so it leads to worse disease in two- to nine-year-olds, and so other vaccine candidates are in development. Here's one of them being developed at the NIH. It's called TV003. It's a attenuated vaccine, the tetravalent, produced by mutagenesis of an infectious clone, taking out 30 bases from the three-prime non-coding region. And one dose of this gave 100% protection versus challenge. So I suspect this may one day uh, replace Denvaxia. As you know, let's wrap this up with a, a discussion of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Uh, there have been many, many vaccines in development globally. This wonderful graphic shows the 276 in development, 107 in clinical testing, 24 in use, and they cover pretty much all of the categories we've talked about. So, they, And on this graphic, the color is... Uh, inactivated, uh, live attenuated, protein subunit, DNA or RNA-based, replicating or non-replicating vectors, virus-like particles, and others. Uh, and you can see phase one, two, and three, uh, an approval down here uh, at the right. And um, so here, uh, very few vaccines have reached that approval phase, as you can see. And of course, the leading ones include uh, two mRNA vaccines, um, a number of adenovirus vectored vaccines and uh, some others, protein-based vaccines and activated vaccines and so forth. So everything we've talked about is really covered. Many of the vaccines focus on the spike protein, which is needed to attach to ACE2. So the idea being that antibodies against the spike will block infection. Uh, here's the model of spike binding to ACE2 in red. And most uh, vaccines with the exception of some, uh, encode a prefusion spike where we add two prolines to the C-terminal uh, S2 here, and that keeps it locked in the prefusion state. The mRNA vaccines make basically a, an RNA encoding that spike protein, 1,273 amino acids. The RNA is derived by in vitro transcription using a bacteriophage T7 RNA polymerase. And you take a DNA copy of the spike with a promoter for the polymerase. You add purified RNA polymerase. The polymerase will make many, many copies of RNA in, in vitro. And, of course, the key here was using modified bases so that the uh, RNA is not recognized by the innate immune system and gives much better protein production. Uh, we make kilograms of this RNA. I used to, we use this in our laboratory. We make nanograms, and we're very excited when we do that. But... We had to make kilograms to immunize so many people. It's really a remarkable achievement. Uh, this RNA is wrapped up in a lipid nanoparticle. So it's basically a piece of RNA mixed with lipids to make this particle. And then this is injected deep into your muscle, where it is mainly taken up by uh, antigen-presenting cells like macrophages and uh, dendritic cells. Within them, the nanoparticle is taken up. The RNA is translated. The protein is processed in the APC and presented on the surface, and then those APCs go into local lymph nodes and present them to T cells to initiate the adaptive immune response. And so, and, and that's just an example of uh, the, the mRNAs encoding spike. There are also adenovirus encoding spike as well, which have a similar way of operating. Now, 55% of the world's population has gotten one dose, at least one dose of a COVID vaccine We've given out 8 billion doses globally, 35 million a day. However, 6% of people in low-income countries have 
only received one dose, only 6%. So obviously we have a long way to go. And this is a graphic that shows that countries with share of people vaccinated, the highest ones uh, to the lowest ones, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Kenya, Egypt, very low in terms of the percentage of the pop population immunized. So we can't talk about ending this pandemic until we immunize more of these individuals. I want to end with some of my thoughts on, on COVID vaccines. There have already been some questions about them, but um, remember, the vaccines were assessed by preventing COVID, all COVID, from mild to moderate to severe to death, not infection. And initially, the mRNA vaccines and some adenovectored vaccines and others received very high uh, efficacy numbers in the 90s in some cases at preventing all COVID. And we have mainly focused on induction of antibody levels. And of course, these contract after immunization. They go down, as I showed you in that initial slide. And so this has been considered to be an issue, and therefore we're talking about uh, boosting and so forth, because there is always, if you have high levels of antibodies in the nasopharynx, it will protect against infection, but that's an abnormal state. It won't stay that way. You will always get infected after six to eight months. And so you can't expect your vaccines to always protect against infection. Now, the variants of concern have changes in antibody epitopes, fewer changes in T-cell epitopes. So they will allow some extent of infection and perhaps uh, more than mild disease, but you will still be protected against hospitalization uh, and death, severe COVID. Most people will be because T-cell epitopes are not changed. And as I said, if you have underlying conditions, if you are immunosuppressed uh, or are elderly, you might still have severe disease even after this because the protection is not 100%. And so the vaccine still will present, prevent the majority of severe disease even where the variants of concern are circulating. And I would predict for, for Omicron as well, as, as, as we see the data come in, we're going to see that we'll still be protected uh, against severe disease. Now, vaccines work to prevent infection. What if you don't have a vaccine? What do you do next? Well, then you have to depend on antivirals, which we haven't had much of in this covid uh, pandemic, but next time, which will be Monday. So, uh, no class on Wednesday. I have a, a thesis defense. But Monday when we come back, uh, we will talk about how to make antivirals. And in our last uh, 15 minutes or so, let's take some more questions to go back and find the one that I marked. Okay. Wouldn't a proper T cell response against conserved influenza A regions be an effective vaccine strategy? Yeah, I would. I would think so. Uh, I think the uh, the current vaccines do a poor job at inducing a good T cell response, and so that has to be fixed. And then maybe that can make an impact. I agree. Thank you, Rowan, for your contribution. Appreciate it. There are a lot of questions about aspiration. Daniel Griffin doesn't think you need to aspirate. Obviously, there's a lot of controversy about this, but I'm not going to talk about it. Original antigenic sin. So it's it's really established with influenza virus where the idea is, you say at some point in your life, you see your first influenza virus, whether it's a vaccine or an infection. Then every time you see influenza after that, whether it be an infection or a vaccine, your memory tends to be biased to that original virus, that original isolate or variant. And so sometimes that can be a problem, right? Especially if you went from H1N1 to H3N2, then 
the H1N1 antibodies are not going to protect you. So we mainly see that with influenza virus, and that's why it's important to minimize it. Yeah. What's the status of these two trials against HIV? Um, they are in ongoing. I will, I can report to you on the AIDS lecture, which is later on in this course. Thank you for your contribution, Lynn. Really appreciate it. My husband is 49. I'm 48. Two Moderna's. Both of us are COVID positive. Well, uh, if, you, if you don't have any underlying issues, so the recommendation is to get a booster. So you should follow the recommendations. I have a different view, but I don't want to influence you. So you should get boosted. Might it be possible to improve flu vaccine effectiveness if it were changed to two doses spaced over a few weeks? Yeah, because currently it's one dose, right? Um, I don't, I, I suspect that's been looked at. I don't know offhand. That seems to be a simple enough thing to try, and they do a lot of flu trials, so I doubt that would be the issue. Are antibody tests a better first option before taking the vaccine? I don't think so because I don't think we know what the levels mean in terms of your protection. So you could have a number and then you don't know what it means. So I, I think that's not a good strategy. For the record, I take every vaccine I can get my kids to. I don't understand why anyone wouldn't. Well, I, I would agree with you and I do the same, uh, but not everyone can do that. Using a protein folding program, how, how how close are we to stimulating the evolution of a genome? I, I think we're miles away from it. I think the best way to do it is experimental now, and I don't know of any uh, ability to predict it ahead of time. I mean, we might do it at some point, but I don't think we're there yet. Why won't vaccine target cells descendants carry on expressing spike? The, the mRNA turns over within a few days. One of the few days is gone, and therefore the, the offspring are not going to carry it any longer. Can we um, tell whether or not our adaptive immune response is working after vaccination? You can get an antibody test, which will give you a yes or no that you responded. But if you know, we want to know what that means, I don't think so. So some people feel it's nice to get a plus on the test and that's enough. So if that's good enough for you, you should try that. And you, you right now there's just uh, an antibody test. You can do a at-home antibody test with a lateral flow device and um, you can um, see if you've responded or not. Why do mRNA vaccines show higher efficacy than attenuated? I think the reason is that the, the the mRNAs are very efficiently making this single spike protein, and they're delivered to the APCs, and that is that's all I can say. I'm, I'm not sure we know much more than that, and it's more effective than the uh, the vectored vaccines at doing that. Thank you, Tom, for your contribution. Appreciate it. Yeah. So the. The mRNAs or vaccines are including these modified bases that make really good, efficient uh, protein production. That's part of it. Probably more. Thank you, Nina, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. How do you know polio is eradicated if we don't test for it? Uh, we, we don't have any cases. That's what they're going as indicating eradication so far. Uh, yes, there's probably polio in people's intestines. There's probably polio in the sewer. So, so 
to do that, we have to get to the point where there's no more cases of polio, say, for a year. And then we'll have to switch to an inactivated vaccine and then let all the attenuated virus get away, get out because it's not going to last forever. And you're going to check circulation by sampling extensively. And only when you do that will you know. Does the mRNA vaccine have a viral protein to shut down host cell protein synthesis? No, not in the COVID mRNA vaccines, no. Could you imagine a scenario where eradicated smallpox would crop up? Uh, yeah, you, I could imagine if, if someone got the sequence and made virus and infected someone and then they walked into a city. But, you know, we have in the U.S. a stockpile of vaccines and antivirals just for that situation. So I think we would rapidly contain it. What are the symptoms of polio? So paralytic polio is loss of function of one or more limbs. It could be arms, legs. It could be your, your neck muscles, respiratory muscles. Um, and so if you saw, and this is called acute flaccid paralysis, and it's a specific way of looking for it. And if you see a child with that, then you would ask, do they have polio virus in the stool? And then you would have a polio diagnosis. Thank you, Kate, for your contribution. And yeah, this is a this is a session that explains to you how vaccines work largely. So perhaps it can be useful. Why is lifelong immunization essential? Wouldn't it be sufficient to only immunize until the virus is no longer circulating? Uh, well, because you don't know if it's no longer circulating, right? So you need to make sure that people are immune for their lifetimes. Um, we could check every place on Earth that would work, but we can't. So there's always the possibility that um, virus might be somewhere, as we talked about with polio. Does IPV protect against the vaccine? Yes, it does. So if you got a shot of IPV, then OPV, you'd be protected against vaccine-associated polio. Yep. Yes, dengvaxia is uh, only an issue in children because adults have already most likely been infected. So this is not going to be, the vaccine is not going to be viewed as your first dengue infection. Uh, yes, so thank you to the mods today because when you talk about vaccines, it always uh, it brings up a lot of contentiousness. So uh, I apologize if you've had a rough time I also have a rough time. You should see some of the emails I get, but, you know, <laughs> we have to deal with it. Uh, if we gave the mRNA formula to other countries, could they develop it? Well, it, it really requires manufacturing capability, right? And that's not easy to put up overnight. So that's the issue. Thank you for your contribution. I appreciate it. MicroRNA can make uh, can do things to cell differentiation. Is there any risk of an mRNA vaccine doing this? No, there's no, because there are no cell targets in the mRNA vaccine. So I would say no, nothing at all, nothing at all. Thank you. They promoted COVID vaccines as 90% against symptomatic, but keep changing the message. Well, the... All COVID is, is very different now because um, mild disease is no longer pre prevented because of the contraction of the antibodies. So that can be 70%, 60 70%, depending on the vaccine. But severe disease death is still in the 90s for most of them, if not 80s, which still is great, right? You could not expect more than that. Shouldn't we be concentrating on antibody and focus on memory? Yes, but antibodies are easy to measure. It's clinically useful. That's why we do that. A whole virus-based vaccine like Sinovac is expected to offer more protection against variants. Um, it might, but we don't know, hasn't been looked at yet, because it has more T-cell epitopes, right? So it just might.
when a new variant displaces an existing variant in some populations. Can we say that herd immunity was achieved for the original variant because it could not find more hosts? Well, that's not how we define herd immunity. So basically what happened is the new variant outcompeted the other one for whatever reason it was more fit. So it's I would say no because that's not our definition of herd immunity. Uh, I'm wondering why they are developing an Omicron vaccine because they're not sure. They want to anticipate if there's an issue and be ready. So they did the same with Alpha and Delta. They have vaccines ready to go, but they were never used, not needed. So that's why they're doing it, because they have no crystal ball. They don't know if it's a problem or not yet. What percentage of herd immunity is enough? As I said, the original calculation was 70 to 80 percent, but pockets will invalidate that. Michael Warby has a great YouTube talk on influenza and original antigen. Yes, I, I endorse Michael Warby. He's going to be on TWIV at some point in the future. Why do we need a modified flu vaccine every year but not modified COVID? Well, because what they see is that severe flu starts to go up, right? So if severe COVID goes up, if we drop out of the 90s to some point 80s, 70s, then we'll probably need a COVID vaccine. But so far, we haven't seen that, right? Thank you, Arvinder, for your contribution. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Keith, for your contribution. And I think uh, we should say goodbye now. It's 102. I know you have a lot of questions. If you want to ask more, come back uh, Wednesday evening to Q&A with A&V, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. You can find the link uh, at the, my YouTube channel. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you, moderators, for uh being here today and doing a great job. And um, remember, we'll be back Monday. No class Wednesday. Bye-bye.